Chapter 4. Connor. The pain in Connor's arm is unbearable. That little monster actually bit him. Practically took a chunk out of his forearm. Another car slams the brakes to avoid hitting him and gets rear-ended. The trank bullets have stopped flying, but he knows that's temporary. The accidents have gotten the juby cops momentarily distracted, but they won't stay that way for long. Just then, he makes eye contact with the girl who got off the bus. He thinks she's going to go stumbling toward all the people who are running from their cars to help, but instead she turns and runs into the woods. Has the whole world gone insane? Still holding his stinging, bleeding arm, he turns to run into the woods as well, but stops. He turns back to see the kid in white just reaching his car. Connor doesn't know where the juvie cops are. They're lurking, no doubt, somewhere in the tangle of vehicles. And that's when Connor makes a split-second decision. <coughs> Excuse me. He knows it's a stupid decision, but he can't help himself. All he knows is that he's caused death today. The bus drivers, maybe more. Even if it risks everything. He's got to balance it somehow. He's got to do something decent, something good to make up for the awful consequence of his kicking AWOL. And so, battling his own instinct for self-preservation, he races toward the kid in white who is so happily going to his unwinding. It's as Connor gets close that he sees the cop 20 yards away, raising his weapon and firing. He shouldn't have risked this. He should have gotten away when he could. Connor waits for the telltale sting of the trank bullet, but it never comes, because the moment the bullet is fired, the boy in white takes a step back and he's hit in the shoulder. Two seconds and his knees buckle. The kid hits the ground, out cold, unwittingly taking the bullet meant for Connor. Connor wastes no time. He picks the kid up off the ground and flips him over his shoulder. Trank bullets fly, but no others connect. In a few seconds, Connor's past the bus where a gaggle of shell-shocked teens are getting off. He pushes past them and into the woods. The woods are dense, not just with trees, but with tall shrubs and vines, yet there's already a path of broken branches and parted shrubs made by the girl who ran from the bus. They might as well have arrows pointing the police in her direction. He sees the girl up ahead and calls out to her. Stop! She turns, but only for an instant, and then renews her battle with the dense growth all around her. Connor gently puts down the boy in white and hurries forward, catching up with her. He grabs her arm gently, yet firmly enough so that she can't pull away. Whatever you're running from, you won't get away unless we work together, he tells her. He glances behind him to make sure that no juvie cops are in sight yet. There aren't. Please, we don't have much time. The girl stops biting the bushes and looks at him. What do you have in mind? Chapter 5. Cop. Officer J.T. Nelson has spent 12 years working juvenile. He knows AWOL unwinds will not give up as long as there's an ounce of consciousness left in them. They are high on adrenaline and often high on illegal substances as well nicotine, caffeine, or worse. He wishes his bullets were the real thing. He wishes he could truly take these wastes of life out rather than just taking them down. Maybe then they wouldn't be so quick to run. And if they did, well, no great loss. The officer follows the path made through the woods by the AWOL unwind until he comes to a lump on the ground. It's the hostage, just dumped in the path, his white clothes smudged green from the foliage and brown from the muddy earth. Good, thinks the officer. It was a good thing this boy took that bullet after all. Being unconscious probably saved this kid's life. No telling where the unwind would have taken him, or what he'd have done to him. Help me, says a voice just ahead of him. It's the voice of a girl. The officer isn't expecting this. Help me, please, I'm hurt. Deeper in the woods, a girl sits up against a tree, holding her arm, grimacing in pain. He doesn't have time for this, but protect and serve is more than just a motto to him. He sometimes wishes he didn't have such moral integrity. He goes over to the girl. What are you doing here? I was on the bus. I got off and ran away because I was scared it would explode. I think my arm's broken. He looks at the girl's arm. It's not even bruised. This should be his first clue, but his mind is already too far ahead of him to catch it. Stay here. I'll be right back. He turns, ready to pick up his pursuit when something drops on him from above. Not something, someone. The AWOL unwind. The officer is knocked to the ground and suddenly there are two figures attacking him. The unwind and the girl. They're in this together. How could he have been so stupid? He reaches for his trank pistol, but it's not there. Instead, he feels its muzzle against his left thigh and he sees triumph in the unwind's dark, vicious eyes. Nighty night, the unwind says. A sharp pain in the officer's leg. 
and the world goes away. Chapter 6, Lev. Lev wakes up to a dull ache in his shoulder. He thinks maybe he slept funny, but he quickly realizes the ache is from an injury. His left shoulder was the entry point of a trank bullet, though he doesn't realize that just yet. All the things that had happened to him 12 hours before are like faint clouds in his mind that have lost their shape. All he knows for sure is that he was on his way to his tithing, he was kidnapped by a murderous teenager, and for some strange reason the image of Pastor Dan keeps coming back to him. Pastor Dan was telling him to run. He's sure that it must be a false memory because he can't believe Pastor Dan would do such a thing. Everything's blurry as Lev opens his eyes. He doesn't know where he is, only that it's night and he's not where he should be. The insane teen who took him sits across a small fire. There's a girl there, too. That's when he realizes he'd been hit by a trank bullet. His head hurts. He feels like he might puke, and his brain is still only at half power. He tries to get up, but can't. At first he thinks that's also because of the tranquilizers, but then he realizes he's tied to a tree by thick vines. He tries to speak, but his voice comes out as a little groan and a lot of drool. The boy and girl look at him, and he's sure they're going to kill him now. They kept him alive just so he'd be awake when they killed him. Maniacs are like that. Look who's back from Trankville, says the boy with the wild eyes. Only his eyes aren't wild now. Just his hair, it's all sticking up like he slept on it. Although Lev's tongue feels like rubber, he manages to get out a sec single word. Where? Not sure, says the boy. And then the girl adds, but at least you're safe. Safe, thinks Lev. What could be possibly be safe about this? Hostage? Lev gets out. The boy looks to the girl and then back to Lev. Kind of, I guess. These two talk in an easy tone of voice like they're all friends. They're trying to lull me into a false sense of security, thinks Lev. They're trying to get me on their side so I'll take part in whatever criminal activities they have planned. There's an expression for that, isn't there? When a hostage joins the kidnapper's cause? The something syndrome? The crazy kid looks to a pile of berries and nuts obviously foraged from the woods. You hungry? Lev nods. But the act of nodding makes his head spin so much he realizes that no matter how hungry he is, he'd better not eat because it'll come right back up. No, he says. You sound confused, says the girl. Don't worry. It's just the tranks. They should wear off pretty soon. Stockholm Syndrome. That's it. Well, Lev won't be won over by this pair of kidnappers. He'll never be on their side. Pastor Dan told me to run. What had he meant? Did he mean run from the kidnappers? Maybe. But he seemed to be saying something else entirely. Lev closes his eyes and chases the thought away. My parents will look for me, Lev says, his mouth finally able to put together whole sentences. The kids don't answer because they probably know it's true. How much is the ransom? Lev asks. Ransom? There's no ransom, says the crazy kid. I took you to save you, idiot. To save him? Lev just stares at him in disbelief. But, but my tithing. The crazy kid looks at him and shakes his head. I've never seen a kid in such a hurry to be unwound. It's no use trying to explain to this godless pair what tithing's all about. How giving of oneself is the ultimate blessing. They'd never understand or care. Save him? They haven't saved him. They've damned him. And then Lev realizes something. He realizes that he can use this entire situation to his advantage. My name's Lev, he says, trying to play it as cool as he can. Pleased to meet you, Lev, says the girl. I'm Risa, and this is Connor. Connor throws her a dirty look, making it clear that she gave him their real names. Not a good idea for hostage takers, but then most criminals are stupid like that. Didn't mean for you to take the trank bullet, Connor tells him, but the cop was a bad shot. Not your fault, says Lev, even though every bit of it's Connor's fault. Lev thinks about what happened and says, I would never have run from my own tithing. That much, Lev knows, is true. Good thing I was around then, says Connor. Yeah, says Risa. If it wasn't for Connor running across that highway, I'd probably be unwound by now, too. There's a moment of silence, and then Lev, Biting back his anger and revulsion says, Thank you. Thank you for saving me. 
Don't mention it, says Connor. Good. Let them think he's grateful. Let them think they're earning his trust. And once they're lulled into their own false sense of security, he'll make sure they both get exactly what they deserve. Chapter 7. Connor. Connor should have kept the juvie cop's gun, but he wasn't thinking. He was so freaked out at having tranked a cop with his own weapon, he just dropped it and ran, just as he dropped his backpack on the interstate so he could carry Lev. His wallet with all his money was in that pack. Now he's, he has nothing but pocket lint. It's late now, or more accurately, early, almost dawn. He and Risa had kept moving through the woods all day as best they could with Connor having to carry an unconscious tithe. Once night fell, he and Risa had taken turns keeping watch while the others slept. Connor knows that Lev can't be trusted. That's why Connor tied him to the tree. But there's no reason to trust this girl who had come running out of a bus, either. It's only their common goal of staying alive that binds them. The moon has left the sky now, but there's a faint glow promising a quick arrival of dawn. By now, their faces would be everywhere. Have you seen these teens? Do not approach. Consider it extremely dangerous. Call the police immediately. Funny how Connor had wasted so much time in school trying to convince people he was dangerous, but when it came down to it, he was never sure if he was all that dangerous at all. A danger to himself, maybe. All the while, Lev watches him. At first, the boy's eyes had been lazy and his head lolling to one side, but now those eyes are sharp. Even in the dimness of the dying fire, Connor can see them. Chilly blue, calculating. This kid is an odd bird. Connor's not quite sure what's going on on planet Lev, and not quite sure he wants to know. That bite's going to get infected if you don't take care of it, Lev says. Connor looks to the spot on his arm where Lev bit him, still puffy and red. He had tuned the pain out until Lev reminded him. I'll deal with it. Lev continues to study him. Why are you being unwound? Connor doesn't like the question for a whole lot of reasons. You mean, why was I being unwound? Because as you can see, I'm not being unwound anymore. They will if they catch you. Connor feels like punching that smug look off the kid's face, but he restrains himself. He didn't rescue the kid just to beat him up. So what's it like, Connor asks, knowing all your life you're going to be sacrificed. He meant it as a jab, but Lev takes the question seriously. It's better than going through life without knowing your purpose. Connor's not sure if that was intentionally meant to make him squirm, as if his life has no purpose. It makes him feel like he's the one tied to a tree, not Lev. I guess it could be worse, says Connor. We could have all ended up like Humphrey Dunphy. Lev seems surprised by the mention of the name. You know that story. I thought they only told it in my neighborhood. Nah, says Connor. Kids tell it everywhere. It's made up, says Risa, having just woken up. Maybe, says Connor, but there was this one time a friend and I tried to find out about it while surfing one of the school's computers. We hit this one website that talked about it and how his parents went all psycho, and then the computer crashed. It turns out we were hit by a virus that wiped out the entire district server. Coincidence? I don't think so. Lev's taken in, but Risa, fairly disgusted, says, Well, I'll never end up like Humphrey Dunphy because you have to have parents for them to go psycho, and I don't. She stands up. Connor looks away from the dying fire to see that dawn has arrived. If we're going to keep from being caught, then we should change direction again, Risa says. We should also think about disguising ourselves. Like how? asks Connor. I don't know. Change our clothes first, haircuts maybe. They'll be looking for two boys and a girl. Maybe I can disguise myself as a boy. Connor takes a good look at her and smiles. Risa's pretty. Not in the way Ariana was pretty, in a better way. Ariana's prettiness was all about makeup and pigment injections and stuff. Risa has a natural kind of beauty. Without thinking, Connor reaches out to touch her hair and gently says, I don't think you could ever pass for a guy. And then suddenly he finds his hand tugged behind him, his whole body spins around, and she painfully wrenches his arm up the small of his back. It hurts so much he can't even say ouch. All he can say is, ah! Touch me again and your arm gets ripped off, Risa tells him. Got that? Yeah. Yeah, fine. Hands off. Got it. Over at the oak tree, Lev laughs, apparently pleased to see Connor in pain. 
She lets him go, but his shoulder still throbs. You didn't have to do that, Connor says, trying not to show how much it hurts. It's not like I was going to hurt you or anything. Yeah? Well, now you won't for sure, says Risa, maybe sounding a bit guilty for being so harsh. Don't forget, I lived in a state home. Connor nods. He knows about stay ho kids. They have to learn to take care of themselves real young, or their lives are not very pleasant. He should have realized she was a touch-me-not. Excuse me, says Lev, but we can't go anywhere if I'm tied to a tree. Still, Connor doesn't like that judgmental look in Love's eyes. How do we know you won't run? You don't. But until you untie me, I'm a hostage, Love says. Once I'm free, I'm a fugitive like you. Tied up, I'm the enemy. Cut loose, I'm a friend. If you don't run, says Connor. Risa impatiently begins untying the vines. Unless we want to leave him here, we'll have to take the chance. Connor kneels to help, and in a few moments, Lev is free. He stands and stretches, rubbing his shoulder where the trank bullet had hit him. Lev's eyes are still blue ice and hard for Connor to read, but he's not running. Maybe, thinks Connor, he's over the duty of being tithed. Maybe he's finally starting to see the sense of staying alive. Chapter 8, Risa. Risa finds herself unsettled by the food wrappers and broken bits of plastic they start coming across in the woods. Because the first sign of civilization is always trash. Civilization means people who could recognize them if their faces had been smeared on the news net. Risa knows that staying completely clear of human contact is an impossibility. She has no illusion about their chances or their ability to remain unseen. As much as they need to remain anonymous, they cannot get by entirely alone. They need the help of others. No, we don't, Connor is quick to argue, as the signs of civilization grow around them. It's not just trash now, but the mossy remnants of a knee-high stone wall and the rusty remains of an old electrical tower from the days when electricity was transmitted by wires. We don't need anyone. We'll take what we need. Risa sighs, trying to hold together a patient that, patience that has already worn through. I'm sure you're very good at stealing, but I don't think it's a good idea. Connor appears insulted by the insinuation. What do you think? People are just going to give us food and whatever else we need out of the goodness of their hearts? No, says Risa, but if we're clever about it, instead of rushing into this blind, we'll have a better chance. Her words, or maybe just her intentionally condescending tone, makes Connor storm off. Risa notices Lev watching the argument from a distance. If he's going to run, thinks Lisa, now's the time for him to do it, while Connor and I are busy fighting. And then it occurs to her that this is an excellent opportunity to test Lev and see if he really is standing by them now or biding his time until he can escape. Don't you walk away from me, she growls at Connor, doing her best to keep the argument alive, all the while keeping an eye on Lev to see if he bolts. I'm still talking to you. Connor turns towards her. Who says I have to listen? You would if you had half a brain, but obviously you don't. Connor moves closer until he's deeper into her airspace than she likes anyone to get. If it wasn't for me, you'd be on your way to harvest camp, he says. Risa raises a hand to push him back, but his hand shoots up faster and he grabs her wrist before she can shove him. This is the moment R Risa realizes she's gone too far. What does she really know about this boy? He was going to be unwound. Maybe there's a reason for it. Maybe a good reason. Reese is careful not to struggle because struggling gives him the advantage. She lets her tone of voice convey all the weight. Let go of me. Why? Exactly what do you think I'll do to you? This is the second time you've touched me without permission, Reese says. Still, he does not let go. Yet she does notice his grip isn't all that threatening. It isn't tight, it's loose. It isn't rough, it's gentle. She could easily pull out of it with a simple flick of her wrist. So why doesn't she? Risa knows he's doing this to make a point, but what the point is, Risa isn't sure. Is he warning her that he can hurt her if he wants to? Or maybe his message is in the gentle nature of his grip, a way of saying he's not the hurting type. Well, it doesn't matter, thinks Risa. Even a gentle violation is a violation. She looks at his knee. A well-placed kick could break his kneecap. I could take you out in a second, she threatens. If he's concerned, he doesn't show it. I know. Somehow he also knows that she won't do it, 
that the first time was just a reflex. If she were to hurt him a second time, though, it would be a conscious act. It would be by choice. Step off, she says. Her voice now lacks the force it had only moments before. This time he listens and lets go, moving back to a respectable distance. They both could have hurt one another, but neither of them did. Risa isn't quite sure what that means. All she knows is that she feels angry at him for such a mixture of reasons she can't sort them out. Then suddenly a voice calls to them from the right. This is very entertaining and all, but I don't think fighting is going to help much. It's love. And Risa realizes that her little ruse has backfired. She set out to test him with a fake argument, but the argument turned real, and in the process she completely forgot about love. He could have taken off and they would not have known until he was long gone. Risa throws Connor an evil look for good measure, and the three of them continue on. Isn't it, it isn't until ten minutes later, when Lev goes off to relieve himself in private, that Connor talks to Risa again. Good one, Connor says. It worked. What? Connor leans closer and whispers, The argument. You put it on to see if Lev would run when we weren't paying attention, right? Risa is bowled over. You knew that? Connor looks at her, a bit amused. Well, yeah. If Risa felt uncertain about him before, it's even worse now. She has no idea what to think. So, everything that happened back there was all a show? Now it's Connor's turn to be unsure. I guess. Sort of. Wasn't it? Risa has to hold back a smile. Suddenly, she's feeling strangely at ease with Connor. She marvels at how that could be. If their argument had been entirely real, she'd be on her guard against him. If it had been entirely a show, she'd be on guard too, because he could lie so convincingly she'd never be able to trust him. But this was a mixture of both. It was real, it was pretend, and that combination made it all right. It made it safe, like performing death-defying acrobatic tricks above a safety net. She holds on to that unexpected feeling as the two of them catch up with Lev and move toward the frightening prospect of civilization. Part 2. Storked. You can't change laws without first changing human nature. Nurse Greta. You can't change human nature without first changing the law. Nurse Yvonne. Chapter 9. Mother. The mother is 19, but she doesn't feel that old. She feels no wiser, no more capable of dealing with this situation than a little girl. When, she wonders, did she stop being a child? The law says it was when she turned 18, but the law doesn't know her. Still aching from the trauma of delivery, she holds her newborn close. It's just after dawn on a chilly morning. She moves now through back alleys, not a soul around. Dumpsters cast angular black shadows, broken bottles everywhere. This, she knows, is the perfect time of day to do this. There's less of a chance that coyotes and other scavengers would be out. She couldn't bear the thought of the baby suffering needlessly. A large green dumpster looms before her, listing crookedly on the e uneven pavement of the alley. She holds the baby tight as if the dumpster might grow hands and pulls the baby into its filthy depths. Maneuvering around it, she continues down the alley. There was a time, shortly after the Bill of Life was passed, that dumpsters such as that would be tempting to girls like her, desperate girls who would leave unwanted newborns in the trash. It had become so common that it wasn't even deemed newsworthy anymore. It had just become a part of life. Funny, but the Bill of Life was supposed to protect the sanctity of life. Instead, it just made life cheap. Thank goodness for storking, the Storking Initiative, that wonderful law that allows girls like her a far better alternative. As dawn becomes early morning, she leaves the alleys and enters a neighborhood that gets better with each street she crosses. The homes are large and inviting. This is the right neighborhood for storking. She chooses the home shrewdly. The house she decides on isn't the largest, but it's not the smallest either. It has a very short walkway to the street so she can get away quickly, and it's overgrown with trees so no one either inside or out will be able to see her as she storks the newborn. She carefully approaches the front door. No lights are on in the home yet, and that's good. There's a car in the driveway. Hopefully that means they're home. She gingerly climbs the porch steps, careful to, not to make a sound, then kneels down, placing the sleeping baby on the welcome mat. There are two blankets wrapped around the baby, and a wool cap covers its head. She makes the blankets nice and tight. It's the only thing she's learned to do as a mother. 
She considers ringing the bell and running, but she realizes that that would not be a good idea. If they catch her, she's obliged to keep the baby. That's part of the Storking Initiative, too. But if they open the door and find nothing but the child, it's finder keep, finder's keepers in the eyes of the law. Whether they want it or not, the baby is legally theirs. From the time she learned she was pregnant, she knew she would end up storking this baby. She had hoped that when she finally saw it, looking up at her so helplessly, she might change her mind. But who was she kidding? With neither the skill nor the desire to be a mother at this point in her life, storking had always been her best option. She realizes she's lingered longer than is wise. There's an upstairs light on now, so she forces herself to look away from the sleeping newborn and leaves. With the burden now lifted from her, she has sudden strength. She now has a second chance in life, and this time she'll be smarter. She's sure of it. As she hurries down the street, she thinks how wonderful it is that she can get a second chance. How wonderful it is that she can dismiss her responsibility so easily. Chapter 10, Risa. Several streets away from the stork newborn, at the edge of a dense wood, Risa stands at the door of a home. She rings the bell, and a woman answers in her bathrobe. Risa offers the woman a big smile. Hi, my name is Dee Dee, and I'm collecting clothes and food for our school. We're like giving them to the homeless. And it's like this competition, whoever gets the most wins, uh, most wins a trip to Florida or something. So it'd be really, really great if you could help out. The sleepy woman tries to get her brain up to speed with Dee Dee Airhead for the homeless. The woman can't get a word in edgewise because Dee Dee talks way too fast. If Risa had had a piece of chewing gum, she would have popped a bubble somewhere in there to add more authenticity. Please, please, pretty, please, I'm like in second place right now. The woman at the door sighs, resigned to the fact that Dee Dee isn't going away empty-handed. And sometimes the best way to get rid of girls like this is just to just give them something. I'll be right back, the woman says. Three minutes later, Risa walks away from the house with a bag full of clothes and canned food. That was amazing, says Connor, who had been watching with Lev from the edge of the woods. What can I say? I'm an artist, she says. It's like playing the piano. You just have to know which keys to strike in people. Connor smiles. You're right. This is way better than stealing. Actually, says Lev, scamming is stealing. Risa feels a bit prickly and uncomfortable at the thought, but tries not to show it. Maybe so, says Connor, but it's stealing with style. The woods have ended at a tract community. Manicured lawns have turned yellow along with the leaves. Autumn has truly taken hold. The homes here are almost identical, but not quite. Full of people almost identical, but not quite. It's a world Risa knows about only through magazines and TV. To her, suburbia is a magical kingdom. Perhaps that why Risa, that's why Risa was the one who had the nerve to approach the house and pretend to be Dee Dee. The neighborhood drew her like the smell of fresh bread baking in the industrial ovens of Ohio State Home 23. Back in the woods where they can't be seen from anyone's window, they check their goodie bag as if it's full of Halloween candy. There's a pair of pants and a blue button-down shirt that fits Connor. There's a jacket that fits Lev. There are no clothes for Risa, but that's okay. She can play Dee Dee again at a different house. I still don't know how changing our clothes is going to make a difference, Connor asks. Don't you ever watch TV, says Risa. On the cop shows, they always describe what perps were last wearing when they were put out on APB. We're not perps, says Connor. We're AWOLs. We're felons, says Lev, because what you're doing, I mean, what we're doing is a federal crime. What, stealing clothes, asks Connor? No, stealing ourselves. Once the unwind orders were signed, we all became government property. Kicking AWOL makes us federal criminals. It doesn't sit well with Risa, or for that matter with Connor, but they both shake it off. This excursion into a populated area is, a danger is dangerous but necessary. Perhaps as the morning goes on, they can find a library where they can download maps and find themselves a wilderness large enough to get lost in for good. There are rumors of hidden communities of AWOL unwinds. Maybe they can find one. As they move cautiously through the neighborhood, a woman approaches them. Just a girl, really. Maybe 19 or 20. She walks fast, but she's walking funny. Like she's got some injury or is recovering from one. Reese is certain she's going to see them and recognize them, but the girl passes without even making eye contact and hurries around a corner. <laughs>